Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming in today. Um, we're sorry we're a bit late, but we were waiting for everyone to come in. Uh, my name is Basma Surog. I'm uh, representing Egypt, representing the World Youth Forum, uh, which is happening in December of this year. It's a conference inviting all youth from around the world. Uh, yesterday, we spoke about uh, one of our initiatives. It's called World Youth Forum Labs, uh, which is supporting startups around the region. Um, and it's, it's the beginning of a regional hub for in Egypt for startups and entrepreneurs. Today, uh, we're talking, we have like very dear colleagues here beside me uh, from the African Union. Uh, we're going to discuss challenging traditional roams, ro norms around youth migration. Uh, some of the questions that we're going to be addressing are what are the current migration trends? We're talking about challenging the narrative on African migration. What are the opportunities and challenges in youth migration? And how do we close the information gap and enhance the access to, a di to and dissemination of information to youth? So we have very interesting uh, speakers this morning. We have Ms. Nanjana, Nanjala. She's a writer and independent researcher and political analyst currently based in Nairobi in Kenya. Her work focuses on conflict and post-conflict transitions with a focus on refugees and migration as well as East African politics generally. She's going to present today uh, some information from uh, the report on African migration. And I'm going to give her the floor and then I'm going to present the, the, our two other speakers. Please. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you had a good evening. Um, as you heard, my name is Nanjala. Um, I wanted to begin my presentation by just sort of bringing into the room some of the people, some of the stories that are happening outside because I think sometimes we lose sight of um, the context in which these stories are being told. So to just remember in name the tens of thousands of people who have died trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea, victims of xenophobic violence, migrant victims of xenophobic violence in South Africa, to bring into the room um, Eritreans and Ethiopians um, in Sudan and many other African voices that might not um, have an opportunity to be heard the way they need to be heard. As you've heard, my name, I'm, I'm an independent consultant. Um, I've, we've been working on a project with IOM at the African Union on the first ever African migration report. And the reason why there is an African migration report is because we wanted to challenge some of the presumptions and some of the um, assumptions that go behind telling the story of African migration. As in my own presentation, we tend to focus on the things that are going wrong and the things that are being challenged. We tend to focus on um, telling a story that criminalizes or even penalizes migration, when in fact migration in Africa is a complex historical political process. It enriches our cultures, it enriches our communities, it enriches our societies. And it's really problematic that we've come to a point where the only story that's finding its way to the surface is the violent one, is the terrifying one, is the um, painful one. So the African Migration Report is a multi-year project from IOM Africa to capture the contours of the migration debate as it pertains to Africa. The objectives are simple. We wanted to create an informed public debate about migration. We want people to have an evidence-based perspective on migration, an evidence-based evidence -based project implementation on migration in Africa. But we also wanted to give African people, African scholars, African researchers the tools that they needed to better be able to articulate um, their own experiences, their own challenges, and the opportunities that they see lying ahead. The key findings um, in the document, I could give you um, a breakdown. It's, a, it's an edited volume that contains about 13 to uh, 15 chapters. We're still um, writing one. Um, it's an edited collection that tells a very interesting story. Some of the chapters are very quantitative. It's about numbers and about statistics. 
Some of the chapters are, very, are about stories. It's about bringing, as I did in the beginning, bringing people into the conversation, bringing human experience back into the conversation. The African Migration Report essentially tries to construct um, a narrative from facts, from data, that pushes back against some of the negative assumptions that exist about what, how Africans move. The three themes that I would say unite all the chapters, um, the, the thread behind the thread, as it were, I would summarize as follows. The first is to challenge or to re-examine the data. Who is an African migrant? 79% of all people who are migrating in Africa are remaining in Africa. The vast majority of Africans have no interest in leaving the continent. Very few have even an interest in leaving their regions. Many are simply looking for temporary opportunities to allow them to improve the circumstances that their families face. Most of the stories that we hear about migration from Africa are male-centered, but in actual fact, 47% of all migrants in Africa are women. The one thing that the dominant narrative does get right is that this is a youth-centered process, primarily because it takes a lot of time, energy, to be able to make some of the journeys that some of our people are making. And so the average age of the African migrant is a startling 31. When we look at the numbers, we, we see we see a shift in the ways in which we respond to, we should re be responding to the migration challenge in Africa. So far, one of our chapters engages on the concept of securitization and how building higher walls and building higher, um, stronger ramparts to keep migrants out actually works against what the majority of people are trying to do. Our chapters also look at how people are mostly interested in transient migration. These 31-year-olds, these young women are crossing borders to sell food, to be, enter a new community temporarily, and then move back um, to support their families, to support their communities. As I said, most remain in the region. And the challenge that some of our chapters ask is, are we doing enough to support countries in the region to, to welcome people, to provide them with the opportunities that they need, to help them be safe in migrating and being incorporated and in going back home. The second theme or thread behind the thread that comes through in the chapters is we are appending the narrative, as I've implied, and specifically where are people going. Behind this is also an effort to recenter African narratives. The story of migration across the Mediterranean has dominated the narrative on migration in Africa for the last five years. Rightfully so because of the risks that have, the people have faced in that process. But at the expense of the majority of people who are moving on routes that are much less well understood and much less well supported. I mentioned the example of people in South Africa, Zimbabwean, Ethiopian, Somali migrants in South Africa, who might not necessarily be receiving the support that they need to integrate in the communities that welcome them, but to respond to the challenges that emerge from a country that hasn't necessarily provided them with the support that they need. We wanted to recenter some of these stories and to ask ourselves questions about, are we doing enough to support the people who are not who are moving in places where our attention is not. What do African migrants need? We wanted, the stories that we, we saw in the edited, that we see in the edited collection look at resisting securitization, resisting the urge to frame migration as a security threat. Most people, as we've mentioned, have no interest in bringing harm to the communities that they're entering, have no interest in moving even permanently. In fact, what they are trying to do is to create opportunities and many end up, end up creating opportunities in the communities that they enter. We have chapters on migration and development, and migration and trade in Africa, where we look at some of the data that reminds us that migrants bring so much to the communities that they enter. They're building businesses and they're building community. 
we have an examination of borders, for example, where we look at the border between the DRC and, and uh, Rwanda, for example, where every day on average 20,000 mostly women cross back and forth, back and forth to trade, to build communities, to build, to invest in small businesses, which doesn't conform with our narrative of who we think foreign development and foreign in investment is. And finally, the last thread behind the thread is reclaiming protection. Many of the migrants that are moving in Africa do not receive the sustained attention that they need. And the chapters that we have put together in this book draw attention towards places that might not necessarily be centered on. We're talking about fixing the remittance system, for example, in our chapter on migration and remittances. How can the remittance system be made, be optimized in order to enable people to maintain connections, to create new connections, to sustain connections? We talk about reflections on internal displacement. And are we doing enough to support African countries through these systems? Overall, what our report is putting on the table is the idea that migration is a lifeblood of human, of human existence. Migration in Africa, just as migration anywhere else in the world, is as old as time. This is how our languages are built. This is how our communities are built. This is how our cultures are built. They're influenced by people being able to move and build and invest and grow roots and maintain connections that might not otherwise make sense. We want to remind people who engage with this report that African migration is not a pathology, it's not a crime, it's not a problem, and it's not something that requires the kind of panicked response that we've seen emerging over the last few years. We must resist the co-optation and the corruption of the language that we use to frame African migration and recenter the stories of people and recenter the experiences of community rather than the anxieties of security that are coming to dominate the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our next speaker is Ms. Walusungu. She uh, is an international development specialist. Um, she is the founder of the organization that helps the marginalized in Malawi called Inspiration Corner Youth-Led Initiative. It's pro basically providing solutions for the vulnerable in, uh, in the society, especially youth and women, drawing from the sustainable development goals. Currently, she is based in South Sudan with the UNDP, where she works as a project field coordinator in Turit state capital of the Eastern Equatorial Region on the Recover and Resilience Project, Youth Employment and Empowerment through Private Sector and Value Chain Development. I'll give you the floor as well for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by thanking IOM for hosting the International Dialogue on Migration and taking the leadership and responsibility to dedicate this multi-stakeholder partnership to unlocking the potential of youth to respond to the new challenges and opportunities of migration. Today, I stand before you with so much gratitude in my heart, humbled to have this opportunity to not just represent my voice, but the voices of youth all around the world, especially youth in Africa. Youth living in the cities and in the villages, those on the streets, both the deprived and the privileged. Mine is to amplify their voices. Why? Because they all have something to contribute towards the global world we live in and towards the Africa we want. It is my hope that as you hear my voice, you will hear their voices and begin to take steps towards solving the problems they are faced with because hearing the youth means taking action. As expounded by my fellow panelist, Nanjala, Africa is often portrayed in the media as a continent of mass exodus, as we see images of desperate Africans on overcrowded boats bound for Europe, or those of stranded migrants in transit countries plastered across the television and computer screens. The often sensational and one-dimensional reporting on African international mi migrants has played a role in evoking fear of the so-called flood of migrants 
to European shores. One of the most striking aspects about international migrants in Africa is that most move within the region. Contrary to much media coverage, more than 80% of African migration occurs on the continent. They largely move to neighboring countries. For many people in Africa, moving to a country within the region is the only viable solution. The prospect of relocating to countries such as those in Europe or America is often quickly tempered by the reality of cruel, cumbersome, and highly restrictive visa requirements. Unlike citizens of more developed regions, many Africans, by virtue of their passports they carry, have limited options in terms of the number of countries they can access. Let me bring this point home by telling you a story about the first time I traveled out of my country at the age of 16 to South Africa. I had meticulously saved for this um, travel and it was a church trip. I was very excited to experience new culture and to see new things. We traveled by bus because it was the most affordable for me. Now, when I arrived, the first thing I did the next day was to go out in the streets. I wanted to experience the beauty, you know, to experience what I had been hearing about and seeing on the television. As I walked on the streets, I heard Amwene Mulibwanji. Amwene Mulibwanji is uh, my Malawian language, Chichewa, and it means, how are you, my brother? I was very startled because I did not expect to see, you know, anyone speaking Chichewa in South Africa. But of course, I knew that there were a lot of Malawians in the country. I looked at the young man, he was talking on the phone. And when I saw him, he was selling apples. So that caught my attention because I was thinking, is he just in South Africa to sell apples? So I waited for him to finish his phone conversation and, we, and I dived in. I was like, hey, how are you? And we started talking. And he now told me that he's staying in South Africa and he is selling apples. And I did not believe it. I was like, how are you surviving? Because the rentals alone are so, you know, there's so much. Personally, I came and I could not even afford to rent a room. I was staying at a friend's place. But he told me how in Malawi he had been suffering and so traveling to South Africa for him was a better option because he could afford to live a certain lifestyle, but also he could afford to send money back home to support his family. I personally did not understand why anyone would want to suffer in that way, especially when he said he always has to run from the police because he does not have the legal papers. But I was young then. Fast forward, five years later, I'm a young graduate at my first job. Things were not okay at the organization I was working. We had not been paid for four months. That night, I came home to the shared house with my sister, who is a civil servant in government, and there was no food. We looked at each other with no expression. There was no food, no money, and we were going to sleep hungry. As I tried to close my eyes, fear gripped my heart as I thought about how I was going to get to work the next, the next day. I had no transportation. What were we going to eat? How was I going to pay my young brother's school fees? Right at that moment, the thought of, of the young man in South Africa crossed my mind. He was selling apples to survive in a foreign country. I was a graduate, he wasn't. But I was facing the exact challenges that he had met while staying in the country. If a graduate was going through this, was there hope for the youth who had no education, young mothers, those on the streets? These are the youth voices I want to amplify today. These are the youth voices we recognized and we remembered as we met at the Pan-African Youth Forum in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, this year from the 24th to the 27th of April. The forum brought together about 400 young people from across the continent and the diaspora to deliberate on key topics, challenges, opportunities, and solutions for issues affecting young people of Africa, as well as to co-create so solutions around the African Union Commission's chairperson initiative on reaching 1 million young people by 2021. 
the solutions we provided are directed to the greatest monsters which youth in Africa face. Among other things, poverty, unemployment, lack of um, education and skills, which also happen to be the major drivers of migration. Solving these problems will be killing two birds with one stone. Solutions were provided under the four E's, entrepreneurship, education, employment, and engagement for African youth by African youth with the hope of harnessing their potential. We proposed the following. Under entrepreneurship, two solution pathways were identified for the entrepreneurship stream. Number one, growth capital and nurturing startups. Under employment, three pathways were identified. These are internships and apprenticeships, digital skills and job centers. Under education, three solutions were also identified. These were scholarships, alternative learning pathways and models for teacher development. Lastly, under engagement, four pathways were identified. These were leadership programs, youth forums, exchange programs, and youth engagement mechanisms. About 400 youth came together and one common theme united the discussions and the solutions for the four E's under the One Million Initiative. I remember my team which was tasked with the entrepreneurship. During the pre pre preliminaries, as we got to know each other, we realized that we each had an opportunity, one way or another, of being exposed to an international or pan-African opportunity, whether it was studying abroad or participating in, in trainings, which had automatically increased our chances of being ex accepted for the forum. A forum that required us to represent the two million plus youth in the continent and diaspora. Most of this youth, if not three quarters, live in rural areas. These are the grassroots youth with not, without access, access to internet, transport, quality education. Who were we to represent their voices? Did we understand their struggles to represent them well enough? This conversation made us realize that these youth who make up majority of the continent should be consulted if real change was to be with, within shooting distance rather than using a top-down approach. This is my biggest recommendation as I wind up. If we want new approaches, innovative ideas within the spectrum of migration, then we need to bring the disadvantaged and marginalized youth into the pictures. Most of these youth migrate and face challenges in their destination countries because they have no skills and therefore earn minimum wages and live in drastic situations. They also deserve to be heard. And by engaging with them, new pathways to addressing migration can be identified. In the process of developing policies and youth-centered approaches to migration, let us go the extra mile to reach the unreached youth without access. On the final day, the African Union Commission, private sector, and NGOs committed and launched the One Million by 2021 initiative. African youth had spoken. They committed to implementing the solutions provided by the youth under the four E's. I will conclude by bringing the voices of this youth. Youth I have built a relationship with over the course of the months as I've stayed in South Sudan. What amazes me about this youth is the passion they have for their country. Most of them had migrated to get quality education from their neighboring countries, Kenya and Uganda, and yet they came back home despite the challenges. When they heard I was coming for this conference, they were happy to share their views on migration, and I am happy to amplify their voices today in the video. have that chance to like grow up and enjoy the the culture of my own tribe yeah, as a toddler i was taken to uganda due to the insecurity and the civil war that was ongoing by then waiting for peace for the situation to calm down at home it, it has given a career gap which it's really hard for me to like feel it because i feel uh, my cv somehow is being affected it's not up to date 
can I add um, adding for other uh, international communities, peace partners, if they can give a helping hand. The reason why I migrated from Nimule to Tori Town, one of the reasons was about uh, my education. Another reason also uh, was about uh, no job. The national body can also make some scholarships. For those who are unable to go there, they can do it. We need total peace and stability in a country. I left South, South Sudan at a very tender age because I felt I wanted to go for education that side of Uganda to go and attain better education. At that time, the, institution, the institutions here were, of education were not good enough, so that's why I went to Uganda to go and receive better education. During the war of South Sudan, we have been displaced from our village to another village. And it affects mostly some of us, especially me. I was supposed to start my education, my primary school in 2000. And some, some of the challenges are also the shortage of food. It was also one of the challenges. What we need is peace. The youth make up most of the population in Africa. Therefore, youth have to be got. We deserve to be heard. We deserve to be heard. Hearing them means action. Action needs to be taken. It needs to be taken. We, we deserve, deserve to be heard! Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, this very interesting video. And I hope you continue doing this great uh, work even elsewhere other than South Sudan. Um, um, our next speaker is uh, the winner of the Best African Migration Report cover, uh, Mr. Mikaya Andrea Naivo Nirvena. I hope I said it correctly. <laughs> yes, it's good. <laughs> Uh, congrats on winning the, the Best African Migration Report cover. And I'm going to give you the floor for some of your thoughts on uh, how you designed the report or your thoughts on migration in Africa in general. Thank you. Uh, bonjour à tous. Merci. Merci pour la parole. Um, mon nom est très difficile à prononcer. Vous pouvez m'appeler Chaz, c'est plus facile. Euh, donc, euh, je suis un graphiste, un graphiste qui, est, qui vient de Madagascar. Et c'est un réel plaisir, en fait, de, de venir ici. C'est une grande première aussi pour moi de sortir de, de mon pays. Donc, euh, voilà, c'est impressionnant de, de parler, de vous présenter ce que, ce que j'ai fait pour l'IOM. Euh, <coughs> Et pour ça, donc, je suis profondément reconnaissant pour euh, l'IOM et l'Union africaine, le programme euh, pour la jeunesse, qui m'ont qui permis en fait, d'avoir cette opportunité et de, de pouvoir présenter mes réflexions sur la migration en Afrique. Alors, quand j'ai commencé, en fait, j'ai vu une affiche euh, comme ça, juste sur les réseaux sociaux, euh, comme quoi il y avait une compétition, une compétition de design, et ça m'intéressait puisque le design, en fait, c'est mon quotidien. Et d'autant plus que c'était une compétition euh, dans l'Afrique. Donc ça, je trouve ça génial de, de pouvoir participer à quelque chose de, de plus global que, que de faire quelque chose juste à Madagascar. Et je vous avoue qu'au qu premier rapport, moi, je n'avais pas... Je n'avais pas beaucoup d'idées sur euh, de quoi la, la, migration, la situation de la migration en Afrique. Donc il fallait que je fasse des documentations. Et ça, j'étais surpris parce qu'il y avait beaucoup d'initiatives, beaucoup de programmes qui, qui alimentaient en fait une, une sorte d'espoir en moi. Euh, J'ai particulièrement adoré lire en fait, l'agenda 2063 sur lequel on pouvait voir les engagements et avoir une vision plus globale de ce que nous voulons comme Afrique. Et c'est surtout ça le départ de, de l'inspiration euh, pour designer en fait le, 
le, la page de couverture du rapport euh, sur l'immigration. Dans ces, dans ces engagements-là, je, je, je pense que vous le connaissez déjà, mais euh, ça stipule en fait une Afrique qui est intégrée, qui soit quittée par son peuple et, et qui, soit, euh, qui soit puissant, fort internationalement et qui soit aussi euh, une, nation de, une nation de paix. En fait, moi, je crois dans l'adage qui dit que l'union fait la force et, et en effet, la force euh, pour rester fort, la nation doit travailler ensemble, s'échanger, partager des, des ressources, partager des compétences, euh, s'apprendre un peu de chacun, apprendre qu'est-ce qui se passe dans d'autres nations, qu'est-ce qu'ils ont fait, comme exemple ce qu'on a vu hier, hier après-midi euh, sur le projet Loiran, par exemple, qui, qui va pouvoir être adapté dans d'autres pays. Et, et dans ce sens-là, moi je crois que, que pour être fort, il faut qu'on fasse... Euh, qu'on va dans la même, la même direction, qu'on va dans le même rythme et qu'on suit un même chemin, en fait, un même rythme comme, euh, comme un même bâton de cœur. Et vous avez quoi Moi, je crois que ce même bâton de cœur, c'est un peu comme la musique, en fait. Et quand on pense à l'Afrique, on pense euh, tam tam de l'Afrique, euh, la, chaleur, la chaleur des gens et la convivialité. Et c'était un point, un point de départ pour moi pour commencer le design, en fait, cette musique-là, puisqu'en fait, la musique, c'est l'ensemble de, de beaucoup de critères, euh, beaucoup de gens qui jouent d'instruments, même rythme, même volume et, et tout ça. Et ça, c'est une sorte d'image, en fait, pour moi, pour l'Afrique, parce qu'il faut qu'on bouge ensemble, en fait, pour, euh, pour arriver à avoir un, un futur meilleur, un futur qui soit, qu'il y a plus de lumière. Puisque, au départ, quand on parle de, de migration, on pense toujours, en fait, la, la fuite de ces faux, euh, quelque chose de négatif. Alors, dans la compétition, dans le concept note, l'OIM a parlé en fait d'un avenir meilleur pour la, la migration, que ce soit plus positif. Et je vous avoue que ça me parlait en fait, au vu des projets, des documents que j'ai pu lire. Euh, ce futur Afrique, en fait, c'est pour moi, c'est le mouvement d'un peuple qui fait bouger le continent. Et dans un sens euh, qui soit positif, avec une vague de positivité, de liberté, euh, d'indépendance, de courage et de convivialité. Pour moi, ce futur Afrique, ça m'a inspiré en fait la lumière et des couleurs très vives. Comme vous pouvez, comme vous pouvez le voir sur le, le slide, c'est des lignes très vives, avec des couleurs très vives, à, à l'image de, de l'Union africaine, le vert et le bleu. Euh, dans un sens très moderne et qui bouge ensemble en fait pour donner un même rythme, même à de différentes amplitudes. Amplitude, ça donne le même rythme et ça, ça fait bouger progressivement pour toucher toutes les nations africaines. Et pour ça, euh, le message principal était que, cher peuple africain, nous sommes l'Afrique et nous sommes aussi le futur Afrique. Voilà, c'était ça surtout le message. Thank you very much. I think it's a great way to end this, uh, the, the, our talks with your uh, design. And honestly, as Egyptian, I'm very proud of my African roots. E even speaking with all of you and ha listening to all of your projects and what you do to the continent. And as I, I mentioned yesterday, actually, like our generation, if we're given the opportunity and the chance, will definitely seize it. And I think the examples here on the panel prove this today. I'm going to uh, open the floor now for uh, some questions or comments or thoughts that any of uh, our attendees have. So please just uh, come forward if you have any questions. Yes, please, from the, the presenter from the EU. Uh, good morning, thank you very much. I am uh, Massimo Proni, I'm from the EU mission here in Geneva. I follow in particular migration. Um, I found the presentation very interesting. And um, the, the speaker is very passionate. <coughs> I am uh, mm, 
very interesting in this report because I see there is a way to also uh, change maybe the narrative, which is uh, spread very often in Europe. And um, I would like uh, to have two questions. One, to one is to Ms. Niabola uh, regarding the profile of the people who are migrating, because you spoke about uh, majority of females, so maybe if you can expand a bit of that, because uh, uh, I have information that maybe sometimes are different. It depends probably on which directions people are going. Yeah. And um, <coughs> the other one is to our um, friend from Madagascar, Charles. and uh, <laughs> <laughs> Charles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, I wanted to know what was uh, his um, inspiration in, uh, in finding uh, such a beautiful uh, design for the thing. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, not the majority. 47%, um, um, so it's a slight minority of those who are migrating are women. And the other thing that comes up in the data is that uh, we said about 79%, 80% of people are remaining in the region. And so a lot of, for, for women especially, the long distance travel, because of the risks that it has, because of the um, uh, challenges that they're more likely to face on the way, are more likely to remain within the region, are more likely to maybe cross the border, maybe remain within the country of origin um, than their male counterparts. So, so not a majority of people uh, are women, um, just 47%. Um, the, the further away it is from the country of origin, at least that's what the data suggests, is that the, the, the more likely it is to be um, majority male. But if you look at the, the picture as a whole, then that's what you, you see that discrepancy. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, you have. Probably have a more, um, I have more a vision of uh, flows um, from Africa to Europe. That's why maybe why. And this is one of the things that we are really trying to push back against because we want to tell a story that begins from Africa and not begins from Europe and then sort of looks at what is happening relative to that. We wanted to tell a story that begins in Africa and is grounded in the African reality. And this is one of the statistics, this is one of the factors that keeps getting lost in the data. As I mentioned, um, we look at, for example, the border between the DRC and uh, Rwanda, and 20,000 women cross that border every day um, in one direction and the other direction, trading and doing all of sorts of things. When you start from that story and you think about how we talk about um, free trade and free movement of people on the continent, and people say, well, we need to create an African passport. Well, we are interrogating that. Do we need to create an African passport, or do we need to make it much more feasible, easy, possible for people who are already making these movements safer? Is that where the conversation needs to start? And again, when we look at the youth question, that's another issue that comes up. Who is able to walk you know, across the Sahara? Um, who is able to, do, to walk across Sudan from Eritrea? Who is able to walk from the most common um, route on the continent right now is not the one that's going up to Europe. It's the one that's going from East Africa, uh, people who are remaining in East Africa, first of all, but then moving from East Africa down to South Africa. Um, when the report comes out, I would encourage you to really engage with our, we have two very strong data chapters um, that really start from, well, we're not going to start with any presumptions about anything. Let's just start with the numbers and let's just unpack what the numbers are telling us. And I think a lot of the the, the narratives that are dominating the popular conversation and migration in, around, relating to Africa will really be challenged by those two chapters. Désolé. Ce qui m'a, ce qui m'a surtout inspiré, c'était une définition basique de la migration déjà. Donc le mouvement, euh, dans, dans les réflexions, dans, dans tous les documents que, que j'ai pu lire, donc euh, on L'Afrique exprime en fait un espoir de prospérité, de, un avenir très positif. Donc c'était à partir de ces, ces deux concepts que, que j'ai pu élaborer ça. Et en plus de la musique, en fait, c'était un, un dimanche après-midi. Euh, j'ai vu à la télé juste des musiques et, et à un moment donné, j'ai eu ce, ce déclic-là en fait pour, pour représenter le mouvement. En fait, la musique, quand on représente euh, la musique, ce n'est pas le solfège et tout ça, mais euh, avec le, 
les vagues, boum, boum, dans, comme dans les écoliseurs. Donc j'ai voulu transmettre cette, cette onde, on va dire, une onde positive qui va dessiner l'Afrique. Parce qu'en en fait, ce qu'on veut, c'est que ce soit une nation qui bouge, en fait. Et la migration, c'est ça, quoi. C'est le mouvement, le mouvement des gens. Et, et d'ailleurs, c'est magnifique, puisque actuellement, il y a les actions et tout ça. Euh, qu'on entreprend, qu'on y aime, entreprend, entreprend et que tous les gouvernements suivent. Et c'est ça, c'est ça ce qu'on veut en fait, l'Afrique qui bouge et qui, qui soit belle. Quoi. Voilà. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yes, I can. So, Togo, yes, please. Use the mic, yes. Merci. Bonjour à tout le monde. Un plaisir d'être parmi vous. Je joue ma, ma voix à tous les autres pour remercier l'OIM et exprimer ma fierté d'être là aujourd'hui pour représenter le Togo. Alors, j'ai une question à poser à la représentante, à la consultante, celle de l'Union africaine. Alors, dans sa présentation, c'est vrai, lorsqu'on parle de la migration de l'Afrique vers l'Europe, c'est souvent des images scandaleuses, mais c'est à travers sa présentation, on a l'impression qu'en ce qui concerne la migration interne en Afrique, il n'y a pas de difficultés. Et on a en souvenant les dernières images de l'actualité par rapport à l'Afrique du Sud. Et je voulais savoir ce qu'elle passe par rapport à ça, parce qu'il ne faut pas occulter également cette réalité. Et au niveau de l'Afrique, euh, au niveau de l'Afrique, je voulais savoir au niveau de l'Union africaine, qu'est-ce qui est fait euh, en termes de politique pour faciliter la migration en interne au niveau de l'Afrique Voilà ma question. Merci. Bonjour. Um, je n'aurais pas répondu en français parce que ce n'est pas ma première langue, mais... Um, en anglais. Um, first of all, I, I, I don't work for the African Union, um, lest I say something that is attributed to the African Union um, out of turn. Um, we are definitely not trying to gloss over the challenges that exist. As I mentioned when I began my presentation with bringing people into the room so that we can have a context for these conversations, one of the groups that I mentioned or the many migrants, um, refugees in Sudan, South Africa who have been displaced and fled because of the challenges of xenophobia that they're meeting there. And we know the South African example because it's been in the news, but certainly it is not to say that everything is rosy all across the continent. In fact, we have a chapter that engages with migration and urbanization that looks at the challenge that urban migrants in Africa face in various large cities. We see cities not being um, identified as a site for primary response, with cities not being empowered, municipalities not being empowered to provide the services that migrants need, and therefore a lot of people falling through the cracks of service provision, so they are not able to, for example, access schooling, access adequate housing, access adequate sanitation facilities, simply because the, they, they are they first received by the municipality but the municipality does not have the political, the social, the economic authority to provide the services that the migrants need. And meanwhile, the national government is not probably as acutely aware of the situation within the country um, as they could be, and therefore we see a lot of people falling through the cracks. Um, I, I need to underscore this. The point of this um, challenging the narrative framework is not to paper over the challenges, is not to pretend that everything is all great. Um, rather, what we're trying to do is to introduce a, a significant amount of nuance. We're trying to ask ourselves the right questions about what it means, who is a migrant, where are African migrants going, what do they experience on the way, what do they experience once they arrive. We want to start from the right questions to make sure that the policy responses are, 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 are also the right policy responses. And what we've seen in the sum total of the presentations that we, or the chapters that we've put together is centering on a security response, centering on the fears of Europe creates a disproportionate, em em disproportionate emphasis 
on security challenges and not enough on services, and not enough on safety of the migrants, not enough on community, not enough on society. And this is where the challenge is like what we saw in South Africa, what we've seen between Ghana um, and uh, Togo, what we've seen between Nigeria and Togo, Sudan and Eritrea, Sudan and Ethiopia. This is where these challenges emerge because we don't see the experiences of people and the communities, we simply focus on the experiences of the state. What you'll find in our report is a set of chapters that try to move away from that centering of the state security idea and starting from the individual and starting from the community and kind of building up from that to try and push back against the idea that the only thing that people need to be happy, safe is quote unquote security. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, thank you uh, everyone. I think we're running out of time. So uh, I'm going to thank again, Ms. Nanjala, Ms. Uh, Walsungo and Charles, Mr. Charles. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming in today. I hope this panel was insightful. It was for me honestly a lot. So thanks again, thank you.